Good morning and good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for attending this webinar. We do see a lot of people joining the webinar right now. So what I'm going to what we're going to do is we're going to pause and wait about 30 seconds or so and let more people join. And then we'll go ahead and get started with the webinar. So thanks for your patience. All right, we'll go ahead and get started. So good morning and good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining the Snowflake webinar featuring Chesapeake Energy, a company engaged in hydrocarbon exploration, and also HashMap, a systems integration and consulting services company focused on the cloud and data space. So today I'm joined by Blake Blackwell, Principal Data Architect at Chesapeake Energy. He'll be talking about his experiences migrating to Snowflake and the benefits he has seen using it as a data warehouse and a data lake. And I'm also joined by Kelly Coleffel, Vice President of Marketing and Alliances for HashMap, who's going to cover some best practices for Snowflake and data warehouses. And if you look at the agenda here, you'll kind of see how it flows with Chesapeake and then um, HashMap. And then I'm Joseph Goldberg, a Director of Product Marketing for Snowflake the leading cloud data platform and data warehouse. And I'll close things up at the end with some slides on Snowflake and also I'll manage some Q&A. And on the note of Q&A, please ask any and all questions throughout the duration of the webinar via the electronic Q&A box on the ON24 UI. And we're gonna leave plenty of time at the end of the webinar to answer these questions. Uh, and if possible, when asking a question, please state which speaker it's directed to, Blake, Kelly, or myself. And lastly, this webinar will be recorded and sent to you via email uh, within 24 hours of conclusion of this webinar. So with that, without further ado, Blake, I'm gonna hand it off to you. All right, thank you. Good morning, everybody. Uh, my name is Blake Blackwell. I am a principal data architect at Chesapeake. Uh, I've been working on Chesapeake systems for over 15 years in both the, the data warehouse space, GIS, um, enterprise content management, and then the big data space. Um, so I bring that up to talk about why we have chosen Snowflake. Uh, when you choose a, a new technology, um, it's always a pretty momentous decision um, that's hard to realize all the um, both benefits and challenges that you're going to have. And so having a healthy understanding of, of making this type of decision is important. So with that, Let's just get into what our estate has looked like at Chesapeake for a while now. Uh, so Chesapeake has had an Oracle data warehouse for over 10 years and has a lot of maturity into that space. Um, about four to five years ago, we started moving into the big data arena as well um, and started leveraging Hadoop uh, for that ecosystem. Uh, and, and so what we started to see over time was a, a split between what we considered the innovation platform, Hadoop, and the uh, kind of traditional data warehousing space, which was considered more of the official uh, data platform within the company. Uh, this presents and creates some of the obvious challenges. Uh, the pain points that we saw were that we would have multiple teams performing identical work. So uh, you think about things such as ingestion of data. Um, you would have a team that was skilled in, say, more classic types of technologies like Informatica to uh, do ETL into the Oracle Data Warehouse, and then you'd have a completely different skill set of people that were familiar with Scoop and the stream sets and other technologies to get that data into the Hadoop ecosystem. Um, this is not only challenging for the technical teams, uh, but it creates a lot of challenges for the business because now they are confused uh, where they should perform their analytical workloads. There's, there's not necessarily a great comprehension of why you would do things in one ecosystem over another, uh, and people kind of gravitate to whichever one they know the best or spend the most time, uh, regardless of whether or not that is the actual ideal place to do their work. 
Um, it also created kind of the expected tension between analytical teams because they're solving different problems and different concerns, and then it creates the uh, technical and financial burden of trying to maintain those, both from a resourcing level uh, and also from a licensing level. And so we, we looked at the problem and we started doing analysis over the various cloud platforms because we knew that we uh, long term wanted to resolve some of our technical challenges by moving to the cloud. And uh, we eventually, after looking at things like Redshift and Azure Data Warehouse and, and even uh, Cloudera in the cloud, we, we eventually landed on the fact that Snowflake was going to simplify a lot of these concerns and that it would replace our uh, Cloudera Hadoop ecosystem and also our Oracle Data Warehouse. Um, and as you can see over here by this quote by Mike Green, uh, it, it's being well received by some of our early adopters. And Mike says, Snowflake has been transformative for how we understand and leverage our data. We are able to innovate and iterate against large and diverse data sets at a pace that wouldn't otherwise be possible with other solutions. Once it's cost and time prohibitive, is now fair game. I think that's an accurate summation of how we feel about our choice to move towards Snowflake. And so to give kind of a more illustrative picture of what we saw, was we had over on the left-hand side a lot of relational sources pulling to, into our Oracle Data Warehouse. And this is obviously an easy or fairly easy thing to do uh, with tools like Informatica. And, and then we would have our Data Warehouse team on, on the left doing all this work of both ingestion and transforming uh, that data. On the right-hand side, we would have a very similar type of ecosystem where we were pulling the same relational sources into our Cloudera environment. Um, but we were able to start doing some new and innovative things such as pulling IoT data sets because we weren't as worried about um, the, the performance of storing such large data sets. And we could also bring in some semi-structured data sets that were a little bit harder to bring into our Oracle Data Warehouse. Um, and on the right-hand side, uh, you see the big data team, and I, uh, I like to put sunglasses on them because, again, there was that underlying tension of here's the team doing the innovation or, or you know, the cool kids, if you will, and on the left side, here are the people that are dealing with governance problems and a bit slower moving, uh, which creates a lot of tension and challenge that you, that you ultimately don't want in your ecosystem. And of course, right there stuck in the middle is the user base who is um, confused and sad because they really don't know where to do their work. And so what's happening with Snowflake is we're able to start unifying this data. So instead of these sources going into multiple different platforms, we're, we're going to store it all in Snowflake um, and, and simplify that process. Um, also, we're going to be able to uh, create a lot more unity across the teams, um, and teams are starting to work together um, better, and we're going to simplify a lot of our practices. And you know, our target uh, large rollout is to start creating a happy user base by Q1 2020, um, but we already have some uh, pilot users that are seeing some real benefits today. And what this creates is innovation at scale. Um, it allows for um, both data management, so not um, losing your data governance practices or your controlled warehousing practices, but still having that firmly in place as, as we've long known and done in our Oracle Data Warehouse at Chesapeake, but also providing that unique innovation at the same time. Uh, and, and so, you know, it eliminates some of these pain points. Uh, you know, managing this data takes time, and so now that we don't have to do it in two places, we can run quite a bit faster than we have in in the past. And the other thing that is that is unique and pretty cool about Snowflake is that even though innovation is messy um, and things like Excel are everywhere, what we can do is we can simplify that. Um, but by providing people spaces to do their work without having a negative impact on each other. Uh, so we leverage Snowflake's unique uh, virtual warehousing concept 
um, to uh, to allow people a space to do innovation on their own without taking down enterprise workloads or uh, executive dashboards or BI um, because they're not going to have a, a negative impact if they do a query that seems to run rampant in their own virtual warehouse. Uh, it won't have any derivative impact on other concerns. This is unique to both the Oracle and the Hadoop world where Regardless of whether we had distributed that load in the Hadoop ecosystem or had a massively powerful Oracle system, ultimately we were going to have to control for the fact that uh, the the um, query computations have an impact on each other. And now because we can split that workout load out, uh, we can we can separate it. And so this allows our users, like Mike Green and below, um, to to innovate at his own scale without having a negative impact on workloads that we want predictable and controlled, like executive dashboards. And so Ryan Galt, uh, my fellow principal data architect, has said that we've created a new way for more users to interact with data in new ways. Analysts, engineers, and data scientists can create more value with a lower total cost of ownership. So again, because Snowflake has this unique concept of separating out storage and compute and the ability to give people their spaces to do their work, and we really can start opening up new scenarios that previously uh, was not, not possible. So we say this is Snowflake to the rescue, and, and at a high level, this is kind of what our ecosystem looks like. So we have an enterprise database. Now this is where our traditional Oracle uh, enterprise data modeling workloads go. We have a source database, and you could think of this more like your, your data lake or your landing spot where all of your raw data is landing into. And then we have these databases, and I only have one reflected here, but we have about five or six, which are our innovation databases. So again, you've got your BI virtual warehouse going and performing work against the enterprise and source and returning visualizations to people, um, which is a known predictable workload that we have controlled through normal uh, DevOps types practices. And then we have our innovation warehouse, which is crossing both the innovation database, source database, and enterprise database. Um, to have some unique insights for, say, our finance department or our marketing department and allow them to innovate uh, rapidly without so much heavy oversight uh, that we've had in the past where all workloads get centralized to a, a enterprise data warehousing team or a big data team. And so I quote Oprah here, uh, and it says, you get a warehouse, we all get a warehouse. <laughs> so because we've separated out storage and compute, uh, we can easily spin up these warehouses uh, with basically a one-line SQL statement and give people um, their ability to work. Um, there's obviously some governance concerns there, determining how, what size of warehouses you want to do are all things you need to think about. But the actual physical constraint of creating those resources uh, has been removed from, from your architecture. And so, uh, like I said, we have dedicated warehouse for traditional EDW loads. We have a data warehouse uh, for each project and, and a dedicated warehouse for each domain. So um, a lot of flexibility in this architecture with um, you know very little upfront planning from an infrastructure standpoint, more uh, planning within your implementation of Snowflake. So what are some migration strategies here? Um, I think the first thing that's really, really important is to realize as you migrate to Snowflake that you're undertaking a big thing. Uh, yeah, it, it is simpler than it has been in the past, but it's going to be a challenge, um, and it is going to be a, a long road. Uh, anytime you take something like a 10-year-old uh, Oracle data warehouse in your environment or a four- to five-year a Hadoop environment, um, you're not going to get yourself out of that situation overnight. Um, you might be able to build things fairly quickly in Snowflake, but the migration strategy of hundreds of models and thousands of reports is going to take a, t a lot of time. So it's very important that you have organizational alignment. And I, I think it's very important to think of that in two ways. So one, you're impacting the business. Um, and so it's important that you start getting alignment with your business leadership on this. 
Um, you know, they don't always care necessarily whether it's Oracle or Snowflake. Um, their concern is are they achieving real business insights with the data. Um, and so for you to say, well, you're going to have to repoint your report or you're going to have to re rewrite your query, uh, it's a fairly big thing, and you want to make sure that you have business leadership on that. And the other thing that you need as well is IT leadership. And so making sure that it's not just an initiative dr you know, driven by, uh, say, your data warehousing team, but is across the board is going to get you to a, a much firmer ground long term. Because uh, one of the things I, I like to think about Snowflake is that um, you know, very comparable to um, your RDBMS systems of the past is it is a technology that you want as many teams um, both IT and business jumping on and using. Um, and so you don't want to just consolidate it down to some very highly specialized teams. You, you want to actually have more participation than perhaps you had in the past on, on your other ecosystems. And then there's also um, a large OCM effort of training people, of uh, dealing with kind of the uh, stages of grief that people go through when they, when they migrate to a new platform. So just preparing for that is, is, is essential. The next uh, stage that I think is really important is the architecture. Again, you don't have to think so much about things like, well, what kind of server am I going to buy or any of that, but there is a lot of planning that you want to do. Uh, we didn't get into our what we call our domain-driven architecture um, you know, overnight. We started thinking about what those domains are, how to segment them, how to control them, what security you have in place. And so really designing for all of that from an architecture standpoint is, is something you should do. Um, you also are going to have to retool. Uh, you're, you're probably used to a lot of types of patterns that you've had in the past, um, and, and maybe even some of your technology is out of date with, with cloud-based uh, patterns, whether it be how you do identity management, um, the version of your reporting tool. So you are going to have to start thinking about some of those things as well. Um, and then you need to start building out some of your practices through a data ops fashion. Um, how are you uh, creating these data warehouses? How are you creating these databases and roles? And start building out an approach to where you can handle that, and not just by passing some script over to a DBA, but doing it more in a DevOps or a data, data ops fashion. The next phase that is often one of the most challenging phases is to start ingestion, uh, and really start ingesting all of that data into um, your environment. And, and so again, from a retooling standpoint, you need to think about those things a little bit differently. Um, one of the strategies that we've landed upon is, is using replication. And with replication, because a lot of our data still exists in our local on-prem data centers, it allows us to migrate just the changes against transaction logs over to uh, Snowflake and not deal with heavy-handed uh, truncate and load jobs like we have in the past. And you need to figure out how you're going to stream data into Snowflake, how you're going to deal with APIs. Um, the other thing you need to deal with is once that data is there, how are you going to transform that data? And one of the things that is a good best practice is to really think about ELT over ETL. And by that I mean get your data into Snowflake and then transform. Uh, don't leverage some of your technologies of the past that did transformations within that technology because ultimately you have kind of hamstrung yourself there of lacking compute power, which, which if you had started with just queries in Snowflake, you'd have better execution. Um, and then, of course, go into your pilot phase. You need quick wins. Uh, you need early adoption, and you're going to need champions. Uh, like I said, you, you can't get yourself out of your on-prem data centers overnight, and you're going to need people that will uh, champion your work and, and say, hey, this is a good path that we're on, and continue to provide you some cloud cover um, when, when times get tough and, and people start questioning uh, whether we should do this whole cloud and snowflake thing. And then, of course, move into governance. Um, and on this, you know, it's important to continue to focus that you're aligning to architecture. Uh, it's important that people have clear understanding of what access they have to data, um, that uh, your enterprise models are well governed, 
um, that you have easily knowledge, um, discoverability about what you've built in Snowflake. And so building out a, a decent data governance practice is important, especially as you try to enable self-service. Um, you need to make sure that uh, people can can serve their own needs without um, a lot of uh, you know dedicated time from from your traditional data teams. Some key strategies that we've seen that really help. Um, one of the coolest things that I think we've benefited from Snowflake is this concept of business architecture over technical architecture. Um, we're spending less and less time thinking about. Uh, exactly the number of EC2 instances or the size of an S3 bucket or any of those types of things, um, and focus more on what is practical to implement from a business standpoint. So I talked a little bit about our domain architecture. We're able to put a lot more thought into those things uh, because we're not worried about the uh, you know physical ramifications of creating a database or creating a virtual warehouse. Uh, again, get um, as quickly as you can, move from a truncated and load mindset to a replication mindset. And your network guys will thank you, and then your users will also thank you because now your data is fresh. Um, it's always fresh, and, and that really helps simplify your architecture, and people no longer have to wait for, say, nightly loads or hourly loads to see uh, results in, in your warehouse. Um, also, just start from the beginning doing data ops over one-off scripts. You'll spend a few extra weeks getting your infrastructure set up to do that, um, but it will definitely be worth it um, because you'll be able to track the changes, know how your environment is changing over time, and have control practices. It will also open it up for um, maybe a couple of administrators being the, the key people to creating a database or a warehouse to more controlled practices that allow other people to submit changes um, and then also implement those changes at a faster rate. Uh, I can't say it enough, but get used to the concept of ELT over ETL. I realize the transformational power that you have in Snowflake to run very performant queries, um, and don't rely on a tool to do that within that tool itself. So um, where maybe in the past you had transformed data as you went along with Informatica um, and then delivered that data to your data warehouse, now just do that straight um, through Snowflake queries and let query handle the, the spreading of that load. Work on your tooling compatibility. Make sure that things like your um, your uh, machine learning tools, your your BI tools, can talk to Snowflake. Um, and uh, as always, prepare. Even though you can provide more innovation, uh, prepare for some of that chaos with, with better governance practices. Some of the benefits realize that we have seen. Uh, is that it's it's a superior architecture. Um, the fact that we can uh, focus on business problems over our technical problems cannot be understated. Uh, you know, we're not worrying about upgrades. Uh, we're not worrying about being out of date. Uh, we're not dealing with um, the loss of new features because we are a year or two behind. All, all these things we're starting to, you know, realize and benefit from because we're always getting the latest and greatest from Snowflake. And not only that, um, but we aren't thinking so much about uh, capacity planning problems, but we're, we're thinking directly about what does the business need um, from this environment, what data do they need to get in, um, and, and how can we enable them to do more self-service activities. And so, you know, you know, that's, that really frees us up to think about new types of problems and, quite frankly, the problems that I think we as technical professionals should want over perhaps the problems we have solved in the past. And this definitely simplifies our operations. Um, when you go from ETL to ELT, you simplify your ingestion strategy. Um, so no longer are you worried about cleaning up your data as it comes in. You will deal with that um, through transformational activities within Snowflake. Um, and so if you're going to bring in a relational system, you can simply just bring in all the tables in that database very, very quickly with powerful tools like HVR uh, to, to ingest that and get it started without having to go on a table-by-table -table approach. 
You can also deal with faster modeling. Um, you can deal it right there in the query layer, uh, which gets a common tooling approach and a very powerful um, a query language with, with SQL to, to get the job done. And your operations team will ultimately thank you over time that they are not dealing with a lot of the problems. They're, they're dealing more with cloud governance style problems now uh, than uh, trying to upgrade to the latest version of Oracle or Hadoop um, or dealing with outages or any of those problems. Um, and, and so that's, that's a huge benefit. And then, of course, this leads to ultimately what I think we're all driving for, which is newer insights. Uh, we can have much faster project delivery uh, because, again, not only have you simplified your architecture if you have multiple data platforms in place, um, but uh, your, your ability to execute on those projects is easier as, as you build out your Snowflake platform because uh, the data is there, you're ready to go. Um, and the tooling is, is relatively simple and, and understandable. Uh, and then also it's, it's just easier to scale. Um, you know, we, we create these virtual warehouses, and at some point uh, we expect uh, our IoT data to continue to increase, our workloads to increase, and if we need to have a larger size virtual warehouse, uh, we can make that change in a matter of minutes and move forward. Um, so it's just a very uh, lightweight approach to how you do the underlying technology challenges of handling compute and storage. So that's, that's very beneficial to us. Um, at this time, I'm going to turn this over to Kelly um, from HashMap, who we have worked with um, as we've started to build out this practice and this new discipline, and he's going to discuss some best practices. Yeah, thank you, Blake. I really appreciate it. Um, for everyone, HashMap's been a Snowflake SI partner for the last couple of years. We've worked with clients really ranging across a number of migration types to Snowflake. So think Nateza, Teradata, Exadata, Cloudera, other traditional big data platforms. And in addition to the migrations, though, we've worked with clients on net new cloud data warehouses and new analytics applications. And, and when I was thinking about this, one of the most common questions that we get asked by our Snow, Snowflake clients is, what about getting data to the cloud and actually into Snowflake? Uh, we have this incredible cloud data warehouse ready to go, but the, the big but is help us get this data moving, help us get it integrated, help us get that engineering done and the data pipelining done so that we can fully take advantage of Snowflake. So with that as the background, I was asked to share a few best practices with you, some themes that we're discussing with our clients as they're making this move to the cloud and Snowflake. I think what will be interesting, you're going to see some repeating themes uh, right out of the gate here with what Blake was talking about at Chesapeake. So he, he said it. Think first about an ELT-based approach to your data pipelines. Uh, Blake talked about this in his migration phases, as well as some of the benefits that they've realized. So when you consider the cloud, you consider how you can best take advantage of what the cloud delivers with regard to your data pipelines. I kind of think about it in relation to maybe my morning commute. I drive a Chevy truck, get in that truck every day, unless maybe I can get, convince my wife or convince a friend to borrow their vehicle usually not successful with that. My, my truck or my infrastructure, if you will, is pretty well locked in. It's, it's that same thing, unless I want to splurge on some new capital expense, not anxious to do that with all the holidays coming up here. And for years, I think we've been used to this ETL, this extract, transform, load paradigm, where generally we had a pretty limited supply of compute, or that compute was really expensive, or that compute affected a lot of my key users that were doing reporting and analytics. I didn't want to you know, kind of mess that ecosystem up. So what the cloud enables me to customize is really that driving experience on my commute and almost everything in between. If the infrastructure is run and managed by the cloud vendor or a combination of the cloud vendor and Snowflake, I really don't have to think about this. Blake talked about that. It, it's just out of the equation. And I think when you consider the cloud and what you're doing to move workloads to the cloud in Snowflake, not as a lift and shift of your existing ETL. Can it be done that way? Yeah, it can. Is it the best way to approach it? In many cases, probably not. 
really look at ways, I encourage you, look at ways to modernize your data pipeline, leverage the power of Snowflake to take advantage of all that goodness that Snowflake brings to the table. Unlimited independent compute co uh, clusters, it's these virtual warehouses that Blake was talking about. Consumption-based model, pay by the second, it's, it's wonderful. Low to no management overhead. You know, I, I don't really want to care about how the infrastructure is wired up underneath. That's the beauty of it. So, you know, modern uh, ELT solutions today will allow me to push that processing directly to Snowflake as opposed to running it in an ETL engine's database. So those processes, those transformations run in Snowflake. We're seeing this across a number of solutions. You look at... Uh, you know, solutions like Fivetran, Matillion, DBT, Talent, et cetera, are all leveraging uh, in some form, fashion, or another that compute power of Snowflake. So if you, if you go the ETL route, which I uh, highly recommend, you will avoid having to solve a lot of those performance problems. You're not going to be yanking data out of Snowflake to do transformations in another engine. So you'll get some really nice cost of, uh, cost of inefficiencies taken out of the equation. Uh, you'll see some real dollars. And I think you're also going to see some compute efficiencies from not moving that data back and forth. So best practice number one, ELT over ETL. Number two, uh, Snowflake has some really unique strengths. Blake talked about a number of these. Uh, so get to know Snowflake. Get to know your, your Snowflake data warehouse. Two things really stand out. And these are pretty general. But number one, Snowflake was developed in the cloud for the cloud. It is really a cloud native architecture, and, and it's also a SaaS solution. So, you know, what's, what's really cool and unique about Snowflake as a SaaS solution is you can actually pick your cloud. You know, I'm, I'm, I do know who my class is, AWS, Azure, or GCP. So, so number, one, number two, it was also developed specifically for data warehousing and analytics workloads. So, no, it's not a transactional database. It's not an operational data store. It's not a historian. It's not a graph database. Of course, I can you know, store, manage, and process structured and semi-structured data, but that's in the context of a cloud data warehouse. So, you know, when you think about the architecture and you think about maybe using a cache within Snowflake, I can cache the results of a, a query that's executed and keep using that and not have to you know, burn more cycles or, you know, get tremendous performance out of the out of the system, get to know the data warehouse. Do I want to resize a warehouse to improve query performance with larger queries? Where might I want to auto suspend to ensure that I'm maximizing my credits that I have with Snowflake in that per second billing? You know, those types of things understand really, really well how Snowflake works. And I, I think you're going to be able to not only get more value from a business outcome standpoint out of it, but you're really going to see some huge price advantages as well. So that would be number two, get to know your data warehouse. Number three, uh, really try to avoid option fatigue. I, you know, you, you don't be like this little wooden figure who's getting destroyed by his uh, Jenga block options. It, it's uh, we talk to a lot of clients that I, I feel like they're they're like this this wooden figure here. The, their eyes kind of roll back in the head whenever they are thinking about all the options that are available uh, in this space, uh, especially talking going on prem to cloud because there's so many options out there. I've got, and then I've got to think about. Okay, I've got a variety of data sources. I've got all these different data types. Uh, data is in different locations. It's at different volumes. I've got various security considerations. Uh, what about my incremental changes to those source systems? Uh, what about a significant bulk load that I need to do? How am I going to accomplish that? What about the risk associated with a particular thing? My skill sets, you know, the priorities around these. What do I use? When do I use it? How do I, you know, how do I do it? All those types of things. And I would say overall, you know, I, I think everybody's kind of looking for this panacea, this one-size-fits-all tool that will take care of every use case, every pattern, every scenario, uh, and plus, you know, deal with all the non-technical factors that I should be concerned about, you know, things like company viabilities of doing business, all of those things. It's really just not out there. I, I would say that, you know, try to avoid focusing on the 
perfect integration solution. Focus more on those key patterns that you have. And most importantly, Blake talked about this, those business outcomes that you're driving, because there's really not any perfect data integration solution. You could look at them all. They're not, there's just no way they're going to handle every single use case that you have because you've got so much capability with, within the Snowflake uh, platform. You've also got differences between companies because something works for one organization, uh, it does not mean it's going to work for somebody else. It may There may be an existing technology stack in place that's already approved. Maybe there's company policies, culture, you know, security, business process uniqueness. I mean, the list goes on and on. There's just not one size. So when we do uh, data integration workshops, uh, just to make some sense out of the proliferation of tools that are out there, we've tried to group data integration solutions into, I don't know, eight, nine, 10 categories. Think things like, you know, this category of cloud centric or a category of traditional ETL or a category of data flow and a number of others. Um, you know, I, I think when you look back at the on-premise world, we've kind of gravitated around over the years, I guess, to using, uh, for the most part, a single IT centric solution in a lot of cases. But I think today, as you look at modern approaches with the cloud, it, think beyond a single tool, especially if you want to keep up with the demands of your stakeholders. It, it may require maybe two or three in your bag. I'm not saying 100, but, but have a couple of things there that you can go to. And, uh, you know, really these, the, the long, drawn-out uh, projects in IT just aren't well-received anymore, at least not in this data and analytics space. We're very, very used to moving quick, uh, proving something out or, or not proving something out, and moving on to the next high-value item. So try not to get locked into a unicorn solution mindset, really be outcome-focused, determine what the correct balance of technical and business fit is for you and your individual organization, and I think lastly, be realistic about the delivery capabilities that you have. So I think when uh, to wrap up, when thinking about going from on-prem to the cloud and Snowflake, I hope that these three uh, best practices or themes have helped a little bit. And I really encourage you to do your best to ensure that your data pipelines are, are really uh, simple, speedy, sustainable, and, and self-serve. So with that, I will send it back to Joe. Excellent. Thank you very much. Kelly. So just a quick reminder to folks in the line, uh, if you have a question for either panelist, uh, myself included, please submit it via the Q&A box on the On24 UI. We've had some really good questions come in and we're gonna looking forward to more questions to come in and we'll answer them at the end of the session here. So I'm gonna try to cover this about five minutes or so, or so to get to the questions at the end, but I do wanna do a little bit of a snowflake 101, 201 for folks who maybe are a bit new to us. And, and Kelly and Blake did touch on a lot of these points here, but Snowflake, our mission is to enable every organization to be data-driven. And what we mean by that is most orgs, they aspire to be able to answer all their questions using data, but they struggle for a lot of reasons, harnessing data to answer questions. And that's basically our mission is to harness all that data. And we essentially are a cloud-based uh, data platform, primary use cases as a data warehouse, but also as a data lake. And we're, off, we're offered up as a service. So real simple, you know, access us via URL and we will run on AWS or Azure or GCP. And when you first, um, uh, you know, spin up your, 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 your snow, your, or open a Snowflake account, you get to pick which provider you want to be on. Um, and we can also be cross cloud, I should mention. And the reason organizations pick Snowflake, and this was covered again by, by Blake and, and Kelly quite well, but these are the problems people face initially before they move to Snowflake, is they say, hey, you got a problem where my, I've got a lot of different data, some structured, some is semi-structured, and it's all in silos. Um, especially if it's semi-structured data, a lot of times you just can't get that to a data warehouse. And also they can't share it easily, right? So that's one of their problems. The data is in silos, you can't get that unified view. You can't run good analytics. The second one is scale and speed. It's um, with a lot of data warehouses, especially the on-premise ones, their architecture is very rigid and you have scale and speed issues. Um, and every workload, whether it's an ETL job or a BI query, they're fighting for the same limited compute resources. So you, you have resource contention, you have slow queries and ingest, and a lot of orgs we talk to say, I have to limit who can use the data warehouse and at what times, because it's that bad 
resource contention. Um, and then it's, you know, complex, costly infrastructure, especially if it's on premise uh, with all the hardware. And even if it's even if it's a cloud based, another cloud based data warehouse, a lot of times you have to do a lot of maintenance work to it, you know, vacuuming and, and indexing and manually tuning queries, et cetera. Um, it's, it's difficult. And the end result is the last one, slow, limited decision making. They can't optimize revenue and costs. And, and Snowflake is essentially the opposite of all of that. We bring together the silos. We can, we can, we can handle structured and semi-structured data. We enable secure data sharing. We have unique architecture that I'll talk about in, the, in some architecture slides that, that truly enables unlimited scale and speed. You know, our largest customers are, have over 15 petabytes worth of data. They have, you know, north of 3,000 users um, because we, we rely on the underlying hardware of the cloud provider. And last I checked, you know, AWS, Azure, GCP, they're, they're not running out of hardware. So it scales phenomenally well. And, and, and it is a, uh, you know, a simple cloud-based service. We're kind of an automatic DBA behind the scenes doing a lot of the um, – uh, do, doing a lot of the optimizations for you, so very low sort of maintenance costs, and the result is you have fast, effective decision making. Um, this is kind of what the architecture looks like for most orgs that we talked to in the before, and this looks, you know, Blake's organization was, was a bit like this, but on the left side, data sources feeding into an enterprise data warehouse in the middle, and a lot of times a data lake below it for, for semi-structured data, and on the right, maybe you have data marts in between your, your BI users and the data warehouse because of scale issues. You have to give people slices of data in a data mart. And with Snowflake, it's, it's, very, it's simplified here, right? We, we are, the data lake is gone. We can be the data lake. The data marts are gone. You don't need data marts because of our unique architecture. Um, and then data sharing is secure. You don't have to you know, FTP out insecure Excel files to people. You can just expose um, a Snowflake table to, uh, to someone you want to share it with, whether they're external or not, whether they're a Snowflake customer or not. So a greatly simplified architecture. And I do want to talk about the scale because this is really our, our special sauce here, is we have a multi-clustered shared data architecture in the middle here. And basically in the middle, everyone can store their data in one place in Snowflake. And that would be under the covers if you're using AWS, that would be S3, but all the data goes in there. And every single end user can access that data. Um, every ETL job can put data into there so everyone can access it. And those cogs in there, they represent compute resources within Snowflake. Um, if you're using AWS, think EC2. If you're using Azure, think Azure VMs. But basically you can provision those for each workload. So. You see here the different cogs for different departments and workloads. Everyone gets their own resources. There's no collision. There's no resource contention. And they can get the resources they need. So the larger the cog, the more compute nodes uh, uh, a department or a workload has. And in Snowflake, what we can do is in this image here, you notice data science is maybe running a, uh, a small warehouse. They have maybe limited EC2 nodes behind it. If they start running bigger queries, Within just a couple clicks in the UI, they can scale it up and throw more EC2 nodes at it. Okay, so it's very easy to do that on the fly. Also, a nice thing is look on the left there. The um, the workloads are being done by a sorry, I should say the um, ETL jobs are doing are being done by a larger compute uh, note cluster. And let's say the ETL jobs cease, Snowflake can then auto suspend itself. You're seeing that right here. So you're basically not charged for it. And as soon as someone initiates another ETL job, boom, the uh, compute nodes can start back up. So it's, it's a fair pay as you use model. And the last thing I should point out is we are multi-cluster. So let's say marketing at the top right, their problem isn't we need to run a bigger query. It's we have more end users running similar queries. So we, we have a concurrency challenge. In that case, in a couple clicks in our user interface, you can create a multi-cluster warehouse. So you scale out up to 10 clusters behind a single warehouse to handle concurrency. And at its maximum, a single warehouse can have 10 clusters. Uh, each one can be uh, 128 nodes. So th literally that's almost, that's 1,280 EC2 nodes you could have in a single uh, virtual warehouse. So that is amazing, staggering, um, elastic compute. And that's what really makes it special. And that's why we enable a lot of use cases listed here. Again, we can be used as a cloud, cloud data warehouse as our primary use case. We can be used as a data lake as well, like what 
what Blake is doing. We accelerate analytics. We can help with data engineering. And Blake touched on this as well. By data engineering, we mean pipelines, and we can simplify them by um, you know offloading a lot of the transformations from ETL, sorry, for, from other tools into Snowflake. We can also simplify your pipelines. And then you know we can do secure data sharing. Your data scientists can leverage the data in Snowflake and so on. And you know, fast forward in just a couple of short years, we're I think this actually is now over 3,000 successful customers worldwide using us, large and small. And it's for a wide range of use cases. But the common themes in terms of benefits are more users can access the system, faster analytics. We can output you know petabytes worth of data into our data warehouse, get back answers in seconds, et cetera, et cetera. And then here's another quote from Chesapeake Energy from Steve Tharp, their director of intelligent operations. Snowflake has allowed us to consolidate legacy Oracle and Cloudera environments into one platform, allowing us to focus our resources on delivering value while greatly reducing our support costs. And then here's the benefits again that Chesapeake mentioned, that Blake had mentioned earlier. So I want to pivot now to Q&A because a lot of good questions came in. We've got 15 minutes to handle it. Um, one disclaimer for you, Blake, is we got in a lot of questions. So if a question can be answered very crisply, feel free to give the quick answer, and that way I can, I can, we can run through as many of these as possible because there's quite a few came in. So the first question for you then, Blake, a lot that came in around ETL. So maybe just you know ro roll through. Uh, well, I, I guess first of all, what data sources are you bringing in? People are asking, is it from you know uh, databases? Is it from transactional systems? So one, talk about the, the the data sources, and then two, maybe elaborate on the ETL tools you're using and why. Sure. Uh, yeah. So from the source side, we have uh, three primary uh, relational database systems that we are dealing with. So we have. Um, uh, roughly 30, 35 SQL servers that we're dealing with, three or four Oracle systems, and then a SAP HANA uh, ECC implementation that we're bringing data in. Um, and so, uh, you know, with that, what we do is the replication strategy, uh, leveraging HVR and, and making sure that we're just uh, dealing with transactional changes um, to those to those systems. Um, so that so that was our kind of success story on that, and, and it's dramatically simplified from from just moving that data in because we we ingest uh, underlying databases system as quickly as possible. Um, from more of like the API world, as more things move towards a SaaS type model, uh, we leverage MuleSoft to drop that data off into to Snowflake, um, and then and then deal with uh, parsing out the JSON payload as, as we transform the data. Um, on streaming right now, uh, we're using a, a combination of Kafka and uh, either Snowpipe, sometimes it's a kind of native tooling within Snowflake that we use, or uh, Spark structured t streaming, depending on the, the use case there. Um, on the T side of transformation, we use a tool called DBT. Um, it's a very... Uh, pretty awesome tool, lightweight tool that allows us to do um, SQL execution um, through uh, more of a data ops type practice. So they have things like testing built in, and they have um, the ability to check it into a normal DevOps pipeline and, and, and release it and some dependency management between uh, tables that are related to each other as far as ordering those refresh uh, schedules and incremental pins and those types of things. Gotcha. Perfect. And just for those those in the line, um, Snowflake does offer connectors for Kafka and Spark to facilitate getting data um, into, into Snowflake. And also what Snowpipe is, is it's our uh, serverless tool which basically monitors uh, cloud-based storage like S3 or Azure Blob, and as soon as files land on them, they b basically get micro-batched automatically directly into, uh, into Snowflake, so you get near real-time flow of data from data sources into Snowflake. Uh, okay, so Blake, people just want to know sort of, you, they're, they're, basically the gist of the questions here is, you probably looked at other data warehouses, cloud-based data warehouses, or other than Snowflake. Why did you pick Snowflake over some of the other cloud-based data warehouses? Yeah, sure. Uh, so one of the things uh, that just cannot be understated is the simplicity of the virtual warehouses. 
And so you talked about the ability to scale up a warehouse from, say, a small to a large um, in a matter of seconds. Uh, and so that is, uh, you know, nowhere else to be found at this point. And because of that, it allows you to uh, break up how you're actually architecting the system to give people more opportunities to do innovation. Uh, giving people their own virtual warehouses um, is is very simple. Uh, there, there are kind of some other cool things that we found. Uh, you know, there is a lot of parity in uh, the SQL dialect um, that both Oracle has used and that Snowflake uses. Uh, so the the amount of transition for kind of more of our Oracle data warehouse people is is pretty low. Um, you've got other things that are just nice features about simplifying, bringing in uh, things with Snowpipe that uh, really simplifies the workload, or dealing with semi-structured data. Uh, it's, it's really the easiest I've seen to actually parse out a JSON or an XML payload um, and, and get that into more of a structured state um, from, from any of the other toolings. But, but I think by far the largest reason is, is the uh, virtual warehousing uh, concept that you guys have in place. Gotcha. And then a question for you, Blake, and I, I'm not sure how close you are to the, the data science um, scientists, but how do they run their models in, you know, in Snowflake or with Snowflake? And also what sort of tools do your data scientists use like Spark, et cetera? Yeah, sure. So, um, you know, there are some really good connectors that um, Snowflake has created. Uh, there, there's a Python connector. Uh, there's a Spark R connector. Um, there's a PySpark connector uh, that allow uh, easy data movement back and forth between the platform. Um, so that's kind of primary the way that they might uh, run a query um, and push it down to Snowflake to, to get the results that they want, and then get it into a tool like uh, Databricks or SageMaker. Um, there's some other mechanisms that you could use. Um, you have the ability to export data uh, to a, a cloud bucket technology like S3 or I believe Azure Blob Storage um, to get it into a destination. So again, they could they could build their query on Snowflake, uh, export it to S3, and then iterate in in a you know normal environment like uh, SageMaker or Databricks. There, um, so there's a variety of options. And you can also go to JDBC route, um, but but really I think for for performance reasons, either get into a consolidated file in S3 or uh, leveraging something like PySpark is is the way to go from a from a quick extract, and then and then they can go off and develop their models there. And then, of course, you know uh, the results of those models, the predictions can go back into Snowflake um, after after some sort of inference type problem. So uh, that way, you can visualize it with your reporting tools. Gotcha. And then, Blake, another question on Oracle, um, the move from Oracle to Snowflake. So one is, I guess it's kind of a two-parter. One is how long did it take to move off? And then the other one is, let's see here, was there, um, I'm trying to find, how about, how about take that one, the, how long did it take, and is there, is there anything you would do differently regarding the Oracle migration? I'll try to find the second question here in a second. Sure. Um, so, in all transparency, that's a, that's an ongoing effort. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, uh, you don't you don't undo ten years in a year. Um, I mean, I suppose you can if you're if you're scoped and planned and uh, you know have have a lot of resources thrown at it. Uh, for an organization like Chesapeake, I think it's going to take us you know more like two to three years to fully get off of it. Um, and and so uh, that's. That's just the challenge of having used a technology for a long, long time, um, and that technology being very successful um, on-prem. So um, I don't see that as a negative towards moving to the cloud and Snowflake. I just see it as kind of the reality of the challenges of having an environment where thousands of reports and thousands of um, processes have been built on top of it, and now you have to start unwinding that. Gotcha. Um, yeah. Sorry, keep going. 
Oh, and I was going to say, as far as, like, you know, things that we would do differently, I, I talked about organizational alignment. Um, uh, while we had that, I think it, it could be even greater to accelerate those types of timelines. Um, we, we are, uh, you know, building out organizational alignment more and more as we get deeper into Snowflake. I think if you can do that up front, um, you, can, you can maybe accelerate some of your, some of your workloads to get off because it's, it's just challenging for uh, teams to try to support the old and, and move towards the new. Um, and then, obviously, leveraging a partner like Hash, HashMap can also help as you try to try to manage that uh, difference. And then, uh, you know, it's just uh, for a lot of people, it's kind of a, a rethink of how you do things. So ELT is different than ETL, and you got to get used to that. So uh, helping people with training early on can certainly accelerate your journey as well. Perfect. So, so Kelly, I got some questions here for you in HashMap, and again, just because we've got a bunch of questions here, if, if, if the questions can be answered really quickly, go for it. But the first one for HashMap, uh, what tools are you seeing your customers use to load on-premise data to Snowflake? Yeah, that's a, that's a great question. Uh, <clears throat> I probably should have stated up front, we're not a reseller. So we, we get asked, since we don't resell anything, we get asked to do just about everything. And like I mentioned, when we do a data integration workshop with our clients, generally it's, it's – uh, being categorized or bucketized into eight to ten different buckets. Um, you know, you look at the cloud-centric type solutions that are really more ELT focused. Uh, companies like Five Trans, Stitch, Matillion, Aluma. Um, you know, the the thing you've got to always take into consideration there. What are the security uh, parameters that I have set up for my organization? Uh, will those companies be able to um, uh, leverage the way that I work? You move on, you say, okay, well, I've got a lot of, Blake talked about a lot of uh, SQL data sources, maybe SAP, ERP type stuff. Automating that uh, change data capture incremental pipeline is really important. You've got companies like Attunity and HBR that do a really nice job uh, in that space. Uh, Chesapeake's using HBR today. And then you move over to, let's say, cloud-specific managed services. Depending on what cloud you're on, you've got things like uh, ADF, Azure Data Factory. You've got AWS Glue. Uh, you've got GCP Cloud Data Fusion. Each one of these, while not being necessarily a no-code type solution, has some has some nice offerings depending on what that data source is. And again, what what is the what are the policies and security parameters that you have? You don't want to leave out what I'll, I'll bucketize as traditional ETL, more the IT-centric approach, uh, Informatica, Talon data stage. Um, and you, you look at a company like Talon that now offers query pushdown to Snowflake. So I can now leverage my cloud data warehouse and the, the trans, uh, transformation side of that with Talon, leverage the compute that Snowflake brings to the table. Same kind of thing that, uh, that, that Blake talked about uh, using DBT, another great solution in that use your cloud for that transformation side of things. Another couple of categories, things like a data flow. So we see companies using uh, uh, products like NiFi, which is an open source solution out there to move data, maybe streaming data loads to the cloud and get those into Snowflake, stream sets, uh, those types of solutions. And there's several others. Hopefully that helps a little bit, uh, give a bit of a perspective. Gotcha, okay. And you know, I'll do. I'll answer two questions here. Pretty, pretty. Cool. Try to answer them pretty crisply. One's asking about disaster recovery. How does Snowflake handle it? And I'll sort of, sort of, just at a high level. I think part of this could be how do we handle user error. Um, we do have time travel, which is functionality built into the product, where basically you can you can time travel back in time to let's say restore a table, or, or go back to a certain point of time before an error happened that maybe was caused by user error. Um, additionally, we. We basically, when you, when you write our data to storage for in a cloud provider, we write it to multiple availability zones within that region. So even if one data center of AWS, let's say, went down, the stored data is still in two other availability regions. So the data is always there. Um, and then also, Snowflake does have the ability to do cross-cloud replication and failover. So we can literally take your primary, which maybe is on AWS, replicate it to, let's say, Google Cloud Platform. So even if there's an entire cloud outage for all of AWS, you know, you can fail over to the GCP um, account. So that's sort of, you know, we can handle it that way. And then also what some customers frankly do is they'll also create clones of their data within Snowflake. And some of them will even offload or export data out of Snowflake to, um, you know, to very cheap storage as sort of 
poor man's DR as well. So there's a lot of different ways to approach it, really depending on you know how fast you need to recover your data and so on. Um, and then someone asked about use cases we should not use Snowflake for. Um, I would say don't use this as a as a sort of a, a high performance database because we're not a database; we're a data warehouse. We're designed for OLAP, not OLTP. Um, Let's see, I think I got time for about um, one more here. And uh, uh, let's see here. So, sorry, I'm looking at the deck here. So, so Blake, when you were moving the modeling, your existential dim dimensional modeling in, in Oracle, how did you replicate that in Snowflake? Because you know Snowflake doesn't use the same kind of modeling sort of layout as in Oracle. Yeah, um, uh, you know, so we're we're still undergoing kind of a, a transformation approach to those models um, and, and building them out. Uh, you know, so it had been done uh, through mappings through an ETL process, and now we're dealing it with pure SQL approach um, and just creating the dimensional models as we as we um, design. Uh, the layout there uh, directly within Snowflake. Um, they still look very much like the Oracle models, just some of the some of the ways that we build them are are different, um, and also some lessons learned from uh, perhaps attributes that we had on a certain table um, are either done differently or or done or removed altogether. Gotcha. Okay. Um, yeah, and just real quick, one last question came in around, can more than one department work in Snowflake at the same time? Is there an allocated number of seats? And just to be clear, you can have as many departments, as many users working in Snowflake at the same time, even off the same data. And we don't work off of seats. We don't price off of seats. So that's not an issue. It's basically, we just charge off of um, stored data, which is a pass-through of the cloud provider storage costs. And we also charge based on the compute that you're using, which would be those compute nodes I mentioned earlier. But it's it's unlimited to all departments. And you know we talked about how we avoid resource contention as well. So with that, we are out of time on Q&A, unfortunately. It was great Q&A. Um, just a few closing comments here. So all of you will get the recording of this, of this within 24 hours. Um, I think there's a resources box on the screen there that has some next steps for you. I encourage you all to go to our website, snowflake.com. At the top right, you can sign up for a free 30-day trial where you get $400 worth of free credits. And when you sign up, you also get a self-paced tutorial, which kind of walks you through some demo data and teaches you how to load data into Snowflake and how to query it. And you'll have that aha moment within minutes. Um, and there's a lot of other good content on our website as well to, to kind of see and learn more. And we have a lot of virtual and in-person events that we have that you can attend as well. Um, and of course, if you, if you do want to contact sales to have a deeper conversation, maybe see a, a custom demo, uh, on our website, of course, we have a contact sales link there as well to reach out to uh, your local sales rep. So lastly, a big thank you goes out to our speakers, Blake and Kelly. Thank you, gentlemen. And thank you to everyone on the line for taking out time to attend this webinar. So with that, have a great day, everybody. Thanks.